and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. The madman behind Discami Publishing, as well as the as well as the man behind Big Eyes Small Mouth, and more pertinently to this anime 5e, and get which is now getting its first full-on expansion through Falstavia, along with a along with a cup along with its monster expansions and a bunch of stuff we'll be covering tonight. The one and only Mark McKinnon. How you doing today, man? Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much for having me on again. It's great to be back. As my character often says, glad to see you're back. Nice. Yes, I know that was horrible. No, I will not apologize. But go. I know it's I know it's been a bit, but um, I get the fe I get the feeling when Wizards of the Coast decided to pull that little incident that um there was a bit of scrambling on your part, the way there was everywhere. Yeah, not fortunately, not too much with the, the when we're doing anime five e. It's always been more what I call D and D adjacent. So yes, it's a fifth edition game, but it doesn't rely on the the SRD quite as much, and it doesn't rely on the infrastructure of what D and D is. We're kind of creating a parallel system, parallel game using the same system fun fundamentals, but something that's. Uh, a little bit on the side with our point-based creation system so it was something certainly we kept an eye on and i'd be more concerned about the not so much the the actual publishing of what was happening with it but more the the, the mindset and the marketing that goes along with the fan base and that was more of our concern so i'm glad i caught resolve in the way it did i think it was in the end uh was the coast did what everyone wanted them to do and i think it was the, the right decision i'm looking forward to continuing supporting uh core fifth edition of course, of course. Um, I can I can always laugh at them because they banked so because WotC banked so much on that movie, which they chose the worst time possible to release. Yeah, it's a real crowded market right now, and it's um, you know I, th I think the movie did better with the critics than maybe I would have expected, but in the end, it was up against some pretty tough competition with Mario and John Wick and a few others. Uh, Mario, John Wick, and next month, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Yeah. And appar apparently, the from the reports I had gotten, that movie did worse than Shazam Two, which was a very public flop. Yeah, the difference is, of course, the Shazam with the the universe they have a lot banked with the the DC, where D and D was yes, well, it, you know, for all of us it means a lot, but for the general um, movie watching audience, it doesn't have that same kind of baggage. So uh, I think you know, I'm, I'm glad it's out, and I'm glad that uh, Fifth Edition or Dungeons and Dragons in general is getting good publicity. That's good for everyone's games, whether you're creating a D and D game or or something that's original. I think it's it's good for everyone if we can get more eyes on our industry. Yeah. Granted, I'd li I'd like those eyes to be for to be for the right reasons and not get and not getting ro and not um a company getting roasted by Bloomberg in public. Well, sure, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but then, but then again, they're mostly getting roasted for th for um the stuff that was going on with Magic, especially that thirtieth anniversary stunt. Yeah, the the Wizards of the Coast said. I mean, the the D and D problems, uh, you know, are while they're big to us in the role playing industry, they're relatively minuscule when you compare the the scale of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if you saw, but they but they had put out a thirtieth this thirtieth anniversary um, set of packs, except it was it was booster packs, which were a hundred dollars each. Yeah, I uh, I don't play the game, but I, you know I, I follow the industry news, and uh, yeah, I thought that was really something. Well, that's that's one way to put it. Um, <laughs> but now when it come now the le I had you on not too long ago cov covering um, Eurasia, which which it which was going to be a major um, setting expansion for Be for Besom with. Falstavia does it have a does it have a similar di or different background in the sense that this was a campaign setting that was already made that you were that you were adapting, 
or was or is this completely homegrown? No, th this is wholly original. Now, obviously, you know, the the writer, uh, Robin Flanagan, our creative director, you know, he's had ideas floating around on, on what he's been doing with his own game for, for quite a while with his own gaming. But uh, in terms of what Falstavia was designed to be, we created it from the ground up with some very specific key points in mind regarding uh, the subgenres of fantasy. And so when you think of traditional Dungeons & Dragons, whether it's Dragonlance or, or Forgotten Realms, they're often heavily focused to one style of play, like high fantasy or mid fantasy, low fantasy, where when we were doing Fulstavia, because it was an entire world, we wanted to make sure that every fantasy had its representation and so when we divided up the the world into the the eight major territories or continents that we hit every continent was hitting one of the the fantasy subgenres so this this continent here is more dark fantasy so think more ravenloft style where you got your undead and your vampires and whatnot but in the anime anime style for that and here's a different content uh continent that was more uh, low fantasy or apocalyptic fantasy or high fantasy or steampunk fantasy and we tried to to hit all of the or as many as we can of the sub genres of fantasy in order to make the world approachable to anyone's style so if you want to run a game if your your idea of of running anime 5e is more on the post-apocalyptic version of fantasy think something like um you know, some of the Studio Ghibli, Ghibli films uh, where it's after a war or after an apocalypse. We wanted to make sure that, yeah, there was a place for that in Fulstavia. You don't have to worry about throwing out the entire core setting book for our, our game, Anime 5e, just because you have a different subgenre of fantasy that you want to play in. Which, that certainly addresses one particular issue that, I, that I've... I've picked on the world's most litigious role-playing game for for quite for quite a while. That the whole um, pick a damn lane when it comes to what sort of fantasy it wants to be. Mm. And I I talked about this with one of my um, with one of the people on my Discord earlier today. There's been this problem for years of of it of this claim that it can run any kind of fantasy or that or that it isn't trying to be one particular style of fantasy. And yet, the writing, the the lore, the spe the spells, the pre pretty much everything within the actual rules clearly leans clearly favors one particular um, style of fantasy above all others. Yeah, certainly. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, is, is heavily tied to the Tolkien esque type fantasy. Uh, you can call it high or mid or epic or however you want to you you know claim it. And I think that's how most people run. That's not to say everything with with D and D is done that way. With you know, obviously Spelljammer was very different as uh, Alcadim was was different. So they've they've had some Planescape stuff and we've they've had stuff that's not exactly the Tolkien esque or the high fantasy. But they really haven't embraced um, the diversity and, and partially because when they have a world like Dragonlance or Forgotten Realms, I would guess they want a cohesion with that world we wanted to play the other side we wanted to have the lack of cohesion being the interesting break from it where we have uh isekai elements or people coming in from earth or other planets into the fantasy world and how does that play out where people have, have come in from you know ancient rome and so we're going to have a little bit of uh caesar-esque uh, emperor style influence in some of the areas of holstavia uh, or people coming in from japan uh, same thing that's going to play a little bit differently and so the diversity was the strength we wanted to play into and it seems like a little bit of a mixed bag but i actually think it, it works really well because it gives everyone a chance to 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 shine where they want to play it so you know as a small company we can't create seven or eight different world books it's just not feasible for us to have that many world supports like a like a dnd will have so we have one and then we'll incorporate everything into that one world mm -hmm. now with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, there's a handful. There's a handful of bullet points that are on the Kickstarter that I'd like to, I like to delve into a little, a little bit. Sure. Um, the first, the first of these is the additional attributes and techniques. Um, what are you leading to as far as ex as far as expanding attributes and techniques from uh, vanilla anime five e? 
Yeah, so not a lot, which is why there's only four. I mean, unlike uh, our Big Eye Small Mouth game, which is designed to be a multi-genre and universal where it covers everything, Anime 5e is is fantasy, and so it doesn't have quite the, the breadth. It wasn't intended to have that, and, and it, it shouldn't have that. But as we uh, bring in other aspects that we want to expand the world with the character options that yeah yeah it did make sense for us to bring in some uh, variations on some different things so for example you know something as simple as telekinesis we brought it in as an attribute and we know that obviously in traditional fifth edition you can do telekinesis as a spell but a lot of our attributes aren't spell based they're just uh, ingrained abilities that people can have access to and so we have telekinesis people can do we have exorcism uh, that that is an attribute that people do and we have something called a new new thing called infusion uh, infusion is very similar to it's the analogy uh, analogy to dynamic powers um, that we'd have from when you look at Bessem, we have dynamic powers and power flux infusion is our version of power flux where what you can actually do is have characters who can um, infuse a piece of themselves into items to temporarily booster uh, boost an item like a like a sword, make it more powerful, change some of the components of what an item is. And that's something that we thought was really important to put in, given that we wanted to have a character class that's called the Maker class. And this is a, a character class that particularly infuses items. This is what they do. And so creating a new attribute or, or adapting an attribute to bring it in made sense for what we're doing. So it's not a lot. There's only four, but we, uh, we have a few extra combat techniques as well, um, which is where the, the fourth one rounds up. Up, and we thought that that was important to have in this in this book. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, you you admit you've got you've got a lot and you've got a lot of entries when it comes to species to the point where you decided to do this species tournament thing for the last few days. <laughs> um, obviously, going into all of them would be would be would be one of those we'd be here all day kind of things, but. I'd like to get into some of the highlights when it comes to some of the new ones, as well as some of the alternative versions of traditional mm -hmm. ones. Yeah, when you know, obviously in, in the core rule book that we have for Anime Five E, we hit a lot of the the standard anime tropes. You know, the fourteen different species that we have, and whenever we're doing Fulstavia, we know people like playing different species. That, that's one of the core elements. Uh, yes, D and D obviously is heavily based around. You know, dwarves and hobbits and elves uh, but they bring in new ones and expansions as well and we thought it was completely reasonable to do so and some of the areas we've expanded out is into some more constructs so things that are mechanical in nature think not not quite fully on steampunk but you could lean in that direction so a, a constructed style species we also have um, a, a species that is based on not metal but more stone so not not quite elemental but um certainly comes across as a as a non-living construct style out of crystals and stone that played out well and then uh, one thing that comes up in a lot of anime are things that are variations of different animals and animal like humanoids and so we hit a number of them we have the akuma which are the bear humanoids uh the reinari the fox humanoids we even have some really interesting ones like the uh, the mantai which are insect humanoids and the um, uh, the Karaki, which are more squid humanoids. They can live on, they don't have to live in the water. They can breathe underwater and they can use water. Uh, and they're quite good when they're in water, but they can, you know, they're, they're more amphibious. They can survive on land as well. So those are some of the ones that we also hit. And then, you know, a, a sprinkling through a, a couple other options. We brought centaurs in. We thought that, that was uh, a good addition, something that could have been in the core book, but we thought it works really well in Fulstavia. Uh, we also have uh, dampiers, which are like a vampires. We, so we brought in kind of like a master undead race uh, or species that can play in it. And, um, and of course, you know, going along with the animal theme, the, the Nuki. So you have your, your small little raccoon slash badger or ferret uh, humanoids as well. So we have 14 new species in addition to the variations on the player's handbook species. So when we first did Anime 5e in the core book, we acknowledged that, you know, dwarves and elves exist, but they were more from uh, your traditional 5th edition, your player's handbook for, from Dungeons and & Dragons. And so you want to play a dwarf you, could, dwarf, you can easily go and grab your dwarfs in from D&D and bring them directly into 5e. But we wanted to integrate those core 
D&D style races more into Falstavian. So we came up with variations of them all. So rather than just being a dwarf, we have gear dwarves. Gear dwarves are our default dwarf, just like a, a fifth edition player's handbook dwarf is the default dwarf uh, whether it's a hill dwarf or a mountain dwarf those are the defaults in Dungeons and dragons our gear dwarves are our default these are our more like the, the steampunk dwarves is what they are they're the ones that that are our engineers we also uh, came up with some some variations on uh, for example the halflings our halflings are wisp halflings so these are incredibly gaunt, gaunt, really, really thin halflings who have this voracious appetite. Like they eat 10 times as much as a regular human I would do, and yet they are super thin. And this was kind of playing off a little bit of the opposite of what you think of a traditional D&D halfling. Often they're short and pudgy. Well, our halflings are short and, and wispy. They're very gaunt. Um, so we, what we did is we took the all the main races and we came up with our core Falstavia version. So now we have a default uh, dwarf, uh, the gear dwarves. We have a default elves. These are our dawn elves or our earth gnomes. Um, and people want to play a, an anime 5e specific dwarf. We have that version now. Yes, you can still bring in any 5th edition dwarf or elf or, uh, or uh, tiefling that you want, but we thought it was important to present our traditional species, our take on it within the Falstavia world setting. Now, there, there's also, you had also mentioned in the Kickstarter a few new character classes. You hinted at one of them, but I wanted to go into, um, into, full, into the classes you're adding full stop. Yeah, so the uh, we have a number of them, uh, as we mentioned. We bring in seven new ones, uh, as well as we provide some additional guidance on the adventure class. The adventure class is the one with that's you know fully point based. They don't have specific features at different levels. They're given just straight up points at different levels. So we provide some extra guidance on that. But we do have the seven new classes, and they range from uh, an exemplar, which are kind of like. They're, they're champions. Uh, there's no real way to easily go into them quickly, uh, but we have an exemplar. We have the makers, which are the inventors. We have mind monsters. These are the, the psychic masterminds. So these are ones who, who are really good at mind control. We have pilots, and the pilot, you know, in even in fantasy anime, of course, we have mecha pilots. There are also uh, carts and ships, like like sailing ships. If you wanted to have a sky ship, we do have sky ships in Falstavia. And so a pilot has a lot of their points invested in their gear, their their uh, vehicles that they're going to have. And we know a lot of people are going to enjoy having their fantasy mecha, so that's why we have the pilots. Yeah. We have this, the simulakes. These are uh, mimics. So what they do is they don't have a lot of their own abilities. What they do is they mimic other people's abilities. And that uh, gives them their flexibility is by naturally mimicking other people, whether it's friendly or foe. So those are the simulakes. And then we have the striders. And striders are, they do a lot of uh, long range movement. They can heal, they teleport. So that's what the striders are. And then the final one, which I kind of held to the end of the, is the martialist. And this is the special class that we came up with which is designed to be a, a martial style class. So we called the martialist to be very explicit. We didn't want to use warrior be, you know, or fighter or anything like that. But what these are is these are the non-supernatural versions of a fighter. And so in core anime 5e, there's, there's ninjas and there are samurai and hunters and there's all these different fighting style classes, but almost everything has a, a bit of a supernatural bend to it. So your ninja in a Japanese style RPG like Anime 5 e is going to be a little bit on the supernatural side. But if someone just wanted to play a straight up fighting style character within Anime 5 e yeah, you can you can port in the fighter from D&D, but we want to pre present our own martial class, non-supernatural, which is why we call them the martialist. And those are the uh, the seven new classes that we brought in. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, you you mentioned about about um customizing the adventure the adventurer class is it more of um adding what's being adding what's being added into the um, into these new classes so so that the adventurer can dip into that 
It's it's more about guidance because uh, this isn't a changing of the adventure class. The, the, the adventure class is still the same class progression that's in the base core rules. But what this is is talking a little bit about focusing the adventure. And so we talk about, for example, uh, an adventurer that's uh, more scout focused or an adventurer that's more martial arts focused. And here's some ways you can look on how tailoring your different classes. Uh, because if someone has said, oh, well, I want to play a thief, well, we don't have thieves like as a as a and d thief a rogue we don't have that specifically set up we don't have a specifically a scout uh like the ranger type because those are D classes they are an anime 5e classes but with the adventure being just straight point based it gives you tons of flexibility what to do with those points and we just provided a little bit of class design suggestions on how to kind of focus if you wanted to have a martial artist here's kind of the the adventurer bend towards martial artists or here's the adventurer bend towards being a scout uh, and just give some some general design decision uh, around those for players to help them out a little bit yeah now when it, i've talked to, i've talked a bit about about having an appendix n with with various folks and um, yourself not yourself notwithstanding and I'm curious. I'm curious what sort of what sort of characters in other media com would be good representatives of the cl of the classes. So, in terms of like who would be an exemplar, who would be a maker? You're like like you're looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly obviously a, a huge range, and you know, I, I, a lot of them aren't immediately going to come uh, to my mind as being anime specific like for example a mind mancher someone who's who's mind control i mean it, it plays out to from a babylon 5 psychops uh, all the way up to your your you know, dracula uh, and you know the vampires that can take control of people's minds um something like the the simulates where you're mimicking your abilities i mean you can say that's you know fairly classic is the idea of you know where you can go from uh superhero references you know from x-men characters who can take on other characters abilities uh or you can bring it into more uh like shape-shifting say like Odo from Deep Space Nine as an example. And so uh, a lot of the references I'm bringing up are, aren't anime specific because they, a lot of them are, I mean, I, I, I've, I've watched many more non-anime shows than anime, obviously. Uh, but we know that, you know, pilots as, as a class, I mean, there are so many classic fantasy, you know, a Vision of Escaflone is one of the, the, probably the biggest examples of full-on fantasy mecha. And any of the characters that have their mecha would be that. But you'd also have the bubblegum crisis with the people that have their, uh, their, their hard suits. They would be pilots as well. Or even someone that would be, you could even say, uh, Spike from Cowboy Bebop would be a pilot class. I mean, I don't think he is. I mean, I put him in a different class, but you, you can take the, the different classes and apply them as you wish to the other characters. Yeah. Some like Maker, uh, you know, the idea of a, of a tinkerer in anime and who tinkers with different uh, devices and can do it not just from a technological point of view, but from magical, can infuse abilities and powers into it. Uh, that's not a, you know, particularly original either. We didn't go with these new classes to be 100% original. The idea of a shape-changing or power-enhancing character is is not an original character design, but they are uh, certainly tropes that are very good for role-playing opportunities in an anime game. Mm -hmm. oh, now, when it comes to Mecha, this is one of the big questions that I ha that I feel I have to bring up is what is what sort of Mecha are we de are we dealing with? Are we dealing with spiky boys or are we dealing with stompy boys? <sighs> Well, I mean, the great thing about Anime 5e's system is because mecha are created using the same framework as characters in the sense that they're, you know, you have your attributes. And if they're more sentient style mecha or independent like AI style mecha, you could, of course, bring in your ability scores as well. But because we use the same system, it's really up to you. If you're in your particular versions of your D&D style anime game in Anime 5e, if you want to have something that are, are big, gigantic, 50 foot tall steampunk or organopunk uh, mecha that you're riding along to, to fight the, the red dragons, go ahead. Or if you want something a little more small and personal, so it's more of a kind of an enhanced suit of armor, something that's a little bit um, bigger, but not gigantic, and you're thinking of like like a almost something like Warhammer, for example, Warhammer 40k, where you got your space marines. If you want to have uh, 
your mecca being closer to that you can certainly do so and then there's everything in between when it comes down to fantasy mecca sky ships are are really you know especially i keep going back to to gilby studio ghibli's with miyazaki's produced some amazing stuff and with nasuka for example there's a lot of different fantasy organic mecca that are in there you can create all of it with anime 5e if you want to and uh, it, mecca is not does not mean giant robot mecca means kind of like a like an item it's a it's a thing it's an external thing to yourself but it could be a sky vehicle it could be a walking a robot it's however you want to play it out given the level of technology and uh, diversity you want to have in your own game and since a few of my players spend a, spent a lot of time with armored core they'll probably they'll probably find some interesting ways to stretch the whole mech idea Cause... Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not we're not here to prescribe what people need to do with our system. We're giving you the tools to do what you want to do with the system. And so, if someone wants to go full on Votums or Gundam uh, in a fantasy setting, go to. If that's what you your vision of the game the game is, we say go for it. Although, if somebody wanted to go Votums, I'd probably remind them. You know, there there's there's a re there's a reason why Votums sounds like bottom in the in that story. <laughs> you know. They're glass cannons, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I mean, everyone has their, their favorite, and uh, we think that the robust system in Anime Five E, uh, still sticking within the fantasy framework, and so you know we don't um, embrace going outside of fantasy, but certainly steampunk style fantasy is still fantasy, uh, and that is something you can certainly go with. And in fact, you know, in the core book, we have the race, uh, one of the the species called the Gray. I mean, these are your standard aliens from outer space, and the justification is. Is that these aliens crash landed on your fantasy planet at some point in the past and now they're part of your your fantasy infrastructure of your world even though these species are initially science fiction species but now they're fantasy species because they're in a fantasy world yeah expedition to the barrier peaks comes immediately to mind with that yeah, it's uh, th there's so much diversity you can do. I mean, a great uh, it, it's not a quote for fantasy, but a, a great thing that I read about science fiction. People are trying to define SF. Like, what is SF? And the definition is SF is whatever I point to and say that's SF. And I think the exact same thing applies to fantasy. I mean, fantasy can be what you think fantasy is, and if everyone in your group thinks you know, spaceships are fantasy, then then it could be fantasy. It's, you know, you run the game you want to run, and we hope to give you the tools to do that. Yeah. Um, I was When you mentioned the different types of fantasy mech, I was almost tempted to bring up Dunbine, but um, Dunbine's a Tomino work. Maybe it may not be the best to emulate Tomino when you're, do, when you're running 5e, when you're running anime 5e. Especially if you're Especially considering what happens to most of the cast in the Tomino work. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that myself. Um, but hey, if someone wanted to do it, we we think that the you know the robust system of anime fight you can handle. It won't say it handles everything. Uh, it's it's not a full on universal system. It was never intended to be that. But we want it to be robust enough to handle a lot of different uh, character ideas. Yeah. Um, Tamino, for for the record, is the man is the man behind Gundam along with a bunch of stuff, but he has the nickname of Kill 'Em All because mm. that ten, that's what tends to happen with a lot of his cast by the end of the stories that he's involved in. Uh. Well, well, TPKs are not unheard of in D and D either, so <laughs> yeah, I I don't I don't mind TPKs as long as long as it's a case of it being a consequence of someone's actions. Yeah, that's true. Like I don't want I don't want the whole rocks fall everyone dies kind kind of thing. That's not a that's not a good way to do this. But now ship now um one thing one thing that I was I was curious about is when it comes to the when it comes to the monsters that you're adding in um it's mentioned that they're across the, the challenge rating spectrum, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's going to be an equal amount of low, of low, mid, and high level affairs. 
Well, in, in so in the full Stavia book, we do add 18 new monsters in, but 18 is not enough to, to kind of cover the entire range. And so we provide, it, it is a range, uh, but it's not specific that we have one at every single level. So we, we have them all the way down. The skull wings are only one eighth of a CR. And the largest new monster we're presenting in the full Stavia book, uh, those are the Nox Reapers at 17. And so, you know, we do have, you know, a decent distribution, but in the end, it's, it's not fully equal. There's going to be more kind of geared towards the lower side because we think, we do think more people play uh, fifth edition uh, kind of below tenth level than above tenth level. I just think more games will start out, and it's particularly something that's a different take on traditional fifth edition, like Anime Five E. I think more people are going to be looking at the lower end to start things off with. Mm-hmm. For for me, I've all I've had a bit of a theory as to why that particular um, high level drop off happens, but that's another story. Now. Move shifting into Monstrum Li- Libri. I'm guessing this is I'm guessing this is going to be a theme for for that entry and possible future ones where each where each entry that has the Monstrum Li- Libri um, name is going to be themed around a different biome. Yeah, that was that was kind of the goal with this. I mean, in the end, the, the success of line will determine how many more of these types of books we do. As with all things, uh, you know, something has to be financially viable to continue with it. But when we looked at doing a, a monster style book, which we know that people have wanted for Anime Five E, yes, you can take the D and D monster manual or any monster manual created for any fifth edition game and just use those characters, those monsters directly in Anime Five E. No translation. You can use them as they are. No problem. That that's great. That's the the advantage of having a fifth edition core game like Anime Five E, is that you can borrow from other games. But we know people wanted specifically anime versions of monsters, and they want it created using the Anime Five E system rather than the the more I guess just descriptions that they come up with in a lot of other monster style manuals we have a point based uh templated system and so when we came up with that we looked and said how are we going to do this monster manual and we could just do it and just put in a bunch of random creatures in there or we can have a monster manual that's that's kind of geared towards like level one to four crs for example having a challenge rating uh, breakdown or we can do it by type so here's a dragon book and here's a a book of plants monsters or whatever and we looked at many different options but we we thought why do people use certain types of monsters it's because of where their characters are so if you are going to be in a forest if your campaign if the adventures that's happening inside the forest area then having a book that covers forests would be the most rational way to divide it up not not by challenge rating because of course your challenge can can change depending on what's going on and also you know if you have a book of challenge ratings at one to four and then another one of 16 to 20 well we know for a fact more people would buy the one to four than 16 to 20 so you're also looking at a what's a a feasible book in terms of sales like people are going to want lower creatures and so when we looked at all the different ways to split up we thought well why don't we do it by habitat because when people are adventuring they're adventuring in a particular tile habitat and when you're you're going to run into woodland creatures when you're adventuring in the woodlands or if you're in the mountain areas you're going to run into a mountainous type creatures that seemed to make the most sense for us But we didn't want a book that was only one. Uh, We think that most adventure styles, and you know, I've played certainly tons of D&D games, and and in the MA 5e games we run, the first one that seemed to make sense was hitting that mountain forest dichotomy. And those, whether you can say it's the dwarves and the elves, is kind of your base, which is why forests and mountains are very common. We decided that would be a great first book to do. And if it's successful, then, you know, there's so many different habitats we can bring up from deserts and aquatic and aerial, uh, more dark uh, or like almost apocalyptic areas as well. So there are so many different habitats we could use, but we thought having two habitats in a single book in the first volume that we did of our very first monster Monster Manual for Anime 5e uh, with Monster Malibi, that made sense to us rather than any other way to do it. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's how we decided to approach it. Yeah. And with that with that in with that in mind, I'm guessing I'm guessing that he, that you also have plans on putting in vi- on putting in variants of of some of certain monsters. 
So we yeah, so we do have a few, but we didn't want to do that too much because we know um, yes, in when we did the anime core book, with the monsters that we put in the anime core book were all directly from more or less the monster manual. So you have your orc and your goblin and your ogre and your troll. These are kind of the, the standard fantasy tropes. And the reason why that was important to do it that way with nothing new, just all you know ports from the monster manual, was to show people the to have that bridge between traditional 5th edition or D&D and anime 5e and here's that bridge here's you know you can look up a troll in your monster manual for D&D and a troll in the anime 5e core book and you can see how they're built slightly differently and yet they're the same creature so that was important in the core book but with the monster manual uh, for Monstrum Libri for anime 5e we didn't think people wanted us to just repeat a bunch of stuff that was from the the, the monster manual already and so a lot of the things we did are, are very original and very different but then we have some some slight variations so for example we have um, you know a, a different type of owl bear slight variation it's not an owl bear it has a variation of an owl bear um, and uh, other ones similar to that that we we have uh, here's what you do. Uh, there's a goblins, for example, are very co common. Well, we have what's called a grove gob, or you know, a goblin that's a little bit different. It's an adjacent goblin, like a cousin to the traditional goblins. But this is the grove gob, uh, and so that's what we kind of focus on: is how do we give a good anime focus and ha an anime feel to these monsters, but also things that are going to excite people about throwing them in that aren't going to be the the same traditional monsters that you would get in, you know, if you're familiar with with running a lot of fifth edition. We wanted to have things that are going to make people stand up and go, "Oh, well, what, what's this about?" Mm -hmm. um, and when it, whenever it, I didn't get a chance to ask this when it when it came to anime five e, but when you were developing that, did anyone ever did anyone ever ask you about how you how you guys would tackle layer actions or legendary actions or their equivalent? No, because the the nature of our point based system and the flexibility isn't as restrictive as what or the, the categories of these layer actions are and so uh, and, you know great thing is is multi multi actions i mean i look at this as bringing it back a little bit from what you'd said there, there'll be a monster in the monster manual that'll say it'll be a multi attack it'll attack with two claws and its tail I'm like, well, what if it wants to attack with its tail three times? It's like, that's not what the monster does. The monster attacks with two claws and attacks with a tail. So these very highly prescriptive ways of fighting, we thought whenever I was doing the design, is remove the shackles and give them three actions. So if this character, if this monster, if it makes sense for them to attack three times with their tail in a round instead of twice with a claw and once with a tail, then they'll do that. Um, I don't think it, it makes a lot of sense for us to restrict the flexibility and the narrative opportunities for drama and combat with these characters. And so something like a lair action uh, or these legendary style actions, they're very prescriptive and we avoided that. So we have a much more flexibility. We now have, uh, you know, it's called... Um, extra attacks or extra actions so you can decide as the gm what these uh, as the dungeon master will choose what the extra actions are being put towards are they going to be attack actions or maybe they're actually going to be non-attack actions they're going to do something else multiple times in a single combat round that's not attacking so that's the your answer to that question is no we we didn't want to to prescribe what the monsters are going to do that's for the dungeon master and the players to decide what's best for their game yeah and even, even though the even though the theme is woodlands and mountains do you pl do you plan on putting in um some sort some sort of prefer, some sort of um environment suggestion for the various monsters well, so we do have their, their common habitat and all the, the monster listings. We list what their habitats are, what their communities are. Uh, you know, is this a lone creature? Is this a creature that's in small packs or large family units? And, and where do they typically reside? But, I mean, as we know, I mean, there's there's no reason a goblin would have to be in a forest or a hill land so they can be in a dungeon. Like, any of these monsters could be in different places that's appropriate for your game. But we did give overall feels of, of what would be good for where we see them naturally living, these creatures in their natural habitats obviously when you get more sentient monsters uh the, the the idea of a natural habitat doesn't make quite as much sense because they're more mobile and more humanoid and, and sentient as opposed to a more creature oriented which obviously would be limited to its habitat mm -hmm. yeah I'm, i mainly bring that up because the concept of woodlands well a a but a bayou and a um and a nor and a northern forest are, would technically be woodlands, but 
That's the only right. thing they'd have. In v- very different. And, and, and we, we recognize that. We didn't want to get overly technical with, you know, the, the type of trees that they are in. So, you know, we, you know, in our world, in our real world, there's very strong divisions. If you have a koala, a koala can only be in a place that has eucalyptus trees and like nowhere else in the entire world. A very, very specific. We, we didn't get that specific. It's the idea is, are they in an area with a lot of trees or are they in an area with a lot of rock? That's kind of the division we were going for. But uh, in the end they're just suggestions these are are a collection of stats with some flavor text that players can can use uh, you know and, and dms can use as they wish yeah and to be fair you're not going to find a koala anywhere else because koalas are stupid <laughs> <laughs> well if you're only eating you lip you know one one tree your entire life and that's it i can't imagine that's great for brain development uh, personally but uh, especially when yeah, that mo- <laughs> tree has made it has made it absolutely clear do not eat me yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we have, uh, you know, a lot of good diversity with our monsters, even though it's only two habitats, there's a lot of flexibility and range within those habitats. Mm-hmm. And I, whose idea was it to, do, to um, do the creature cards? Was that your idea or was that um, pitched? Yeah, no, that was that was what I you know, the first idea was was the monster in library. Uh, I mean, I use the um, monster manual whenever I was playing D and D a lot, uh, so it was very common for me. But back in the in 1991, 92, there was this collection of cards that uh, that TSR had put out that had a, a character on them and, and the character stats on the back, or a monster on them and the stats in the back. And I, I got this long box set. It's almost like the the, the what people use to collect Magic the cards these long boxes and it was a factory set and i used that all the time as a dungeon master to bring out a visual representation that was so much easier to deal with on a, on a short card than it was an entire monster manual but at the same time th- there's a lot more text you can put on a page that's eight and a half by eleven than you can on a card so when we looked at at doing them and i thought well if we're doing it in a book format why don't we also offer it in a card format it's not going to have all the same text information it'll have all the same stats so the stats are on one side and the picture is on the other but all the 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 more flavor text i get the descriptions of them you just just couldn't physically put it on a card in fact the cards can't even be card size they're index size cards these are four by sixes and to give a nice presentation on the table to make the the image quite large for players that are looking at it you can uh, but but then you also have the stats very clear on the back and you know so they're not size four font you can actually get a, a good reading of it uh, because of course some of the, the larger crs when you get up to you know above 20 they can have a lot of uh, abilities that you have to include the text on so that was fully my idea based on my what I would use utility as a, as a dungeon master and I thought if we're presenting the, the format for one way why not repurpose it and give it to a second way and people can decide do they want to do both or they just want to have one format what works for their game best mm-hmm. and that brings me to or, to origin story which a background generator is is certainly something that we have a lot of fun with on the in the monastery here. We've done a few, we've done a few get, we've done a few um, streams where we where we end up um, building characters ba- based on full on random cr- random creation, which usually ends up being a a um ru- a running gag of how long until until Brother Zan ends up becoming a harem protagonist. Because it yeah. always, <laughs> always happens no matter what. Nice. And it's, it's not even like he goes out trying to do it. It just happens. And no, but nobody knows why. It's. <laughs> I I liken it to how um, Matt Mercer always seems to roll the worst die results possible, and no one knows why. And not Mercer, <laughs> um, Wheaton. Nobody, mm-hmm. nobody knows what. Nobody knows why he ends up having such bad rolls. He just does. I'd like Yeah, when when we did Origin Story, it was designed to be more of a background generator rather than a character generator. So obviously, you know, character generating is, you know, in, in fifth edition, you roll your stats if you want to roll your ability scores. And then you pick a, a class, you pick a species, and your, your character is virtually done. I mean, there might be a couple of customization there regarding skill proficiencies and armor proficiencies. But in general, they're, they're fairly straightforward. But it was a, a book that I had run to back in high school 
novel, so back in the late 80s, called Central Casting. And this is by Task Force Games. This was a... Central Casting, Heroes of Legend, was a background generator where you're rolling on random tables to determine what your character did before they got into their adventuring career. Where were they born? What 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 is their family like? You know, was their family rich or was it poor? Uh, what are some of the unusual circumstances around their birth or in their youth or as a as an adult what is you know do they serve in the military did they serve did they go to prison and all of these different aspects of uh, an interesting background fascinated me as uh, yes as a player but so much so that i'd bring this book to school and at lunchtime uh, a bunch of our friends would get together and roll up these backgrounds for characters and half of them didn't even role play they, they didn't play in our gaming groups yes i was a DD player but they weren't they just thought the idea of rolling up these interesting backstories was kind of neat so this has carried through for me for you know the past 30 years that i've always loved this idea of this background generator and origin story came from what was done in central casting and the inspiration i took from that and bring it into an anime land it's like okay if you're going to have your character is going to start at going to be a first level and here's the species that you want and, and here's the class that they want well let's go and roll up all their background and what happened to them before they got into adventuring and that might even change you may say oh i, I want to be a, um, a you know a, a samurai that was you know i'm going to have a samurai character and then you're doing this interesting background and it's like wow this is actually leaning more towards not going to be a samurai, but I, I think I want to be a, a broker. I want to be someone who's an information exchanger. And so you might actually take a different class because of these backgrounds. And we thought having a, you know a, a bunch of different tables you're going to choose to give you inspiration and ideas, this is not intended to be you know highly restrictive where you roll on this table and here's the result you get and so you're stuck with this character concept that's that wasn't the intention of it the intention is to give you ideas and to inspire you to create a really different type of character that is so much more than the sum of their class their species and their ability scores yeah and with that in, with that in mind um what would be what would be the what would be the steps when it comes to background generation? Because when I fr when I first saw this, one of the things that immediately came to mind is um, life paths, like the like the infamous life path that Traveler has. Although I'm pretty sure you're not going that route, or the life path system that's in all of the interlock games. Yeah, this is certainly more involved than it. I mean, this is an entire book of just randomly creating your characters. And you're going to run through, you know, if you're a player character, you're going to run through a certain procedures in order to generate your backstory. But this could also be used for NPCs if you, you know, want to create something that's a little bit more interesting. Maybe the DM just wants to add some flavor and they can quickly do a, a couple of rolls to give some ideas for their NPCs. But you're, you can roll up your, your species and your homeland, uh, the society you grew up in. Was it an urban society, nomadic society? your prosperity what kind of parentage and siblings you have your birth locations events during birth uh and then you have events during your youth and your adult life and then and finally your class i mean that's a really high level but from all of those your birth like for example youth events you roll in a something that happens at your youth and that may lead you to another table that you're rolling on another table you're rolling on so you might end up getting conscripted into the military and during the military you end up receiving an injury and through that injury you met someone and that someone gave you this thing and this thing did this uh and then so you can you can have a lot of nested tables you're just rolling the the, the track of your character's path of what's going to happen one of the things we wanted to make very clear with this is we're not restricting and saying someone's like, oh, you are an honorable character. And so now, because you rolled the word honorable, you have to play honorably. Or you are religious, and therefore you now have to play like you're religiously. We don't have the the restrictions on don't come from tables in terms of your personality what they do are more the things around the personality like some of the abilities you might have some of the skills you might have learned some of the people you might have run into uh and as the events that make up your origin story that make up your life that inform your adventuring career so once you say okay now i'm a first level character and i've had all this backstory and now everything i do as a first level character um, I now have so much more history on which I can lean that will inform my decisions as a more 
living, breathing character rather than just a collection of ability scores, classes, and species. Yeah. And do you obviously go, obviously going through a demonstration here would be a bit much, but do you plan on doing a demonstration of origin stories in a um, future in a future update on the Kickstarter? Uh, it would, wouldn't be for the Kickstarter. I mean, something where uh, that would be something I think later would be would be great with a video. I mean, doing try, trying to do it when when people don't have the book, it just it wouldn't make a lot of sense, and they wouldn't they couldn't flip to the tables. Not, the book isn't going to be in people's hands for a while. But I think once the book is out, and, and at least the backers receive it, but you know maybe until it hits the market, and then doing a video where you're actually going to be walking through the process and doing a live generation. Uh, one of the things that I that I did with the uh, central casting during lunch hours in high school was we actually had say ten people all doing their character generating at the same time. So I say, okay, well now we're going to roll our uh, our society that we grew up in. So everyone roll uh, a D12, for example. And then everyone roll it, and then I would just tell people, okay, you grew up in a nomadic society, and you were an urban, and you were uh, pre-industrial. Uh, and so doing things as a group is uh, something you can do as well. Obviously, for a video, I might just be a single one-on-one -on -one, uh, doing it or doing it solo. But um, yeah, it's probably not something we're going to be doing in the short term, because I think it really benefits from having that book in hand. Yeah, and that does and that does end up answering one question I was going to have, and that is, with some of the life path and background generators that I've mentioned in the past, they had a unified die that they'd use, and it sounds like that's not exactly the case here. No, definitely not. You're using the, the full range. There's some D100 tables. There's D8 tables, D6 tables. It really depends on what you're doing. If you're rolling, um, you know, a hobbies, for example, of an NPC or, or player character, that'll be a much bigger die range than if you're rolling on a, a table about uh, structures or food, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that brings me to... Now, obviously, I'm not going to I'm not going to cover much when it comes to the map pack because well, there's not whole, there's not a whole lot to say. It's a that's true. It's fairly straightforward. Yeah, it's like I can't I can't really I can't really dice. I'm not a cartographer. I can't really dissect map design like that. <laughs> and even being a cartographer wouldn't be much good because I'm because I'd be dissecting maps in a fantasy setting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what what is really neat about the map pack, though, is a, un, the, although there are nine individual maps, and each map almost has its own continent. It's not perfectly; there's some bleed over. But in the in the end, you can hold up a particular map and say, "Here is Pachana. This is the the continent of Pachana. Here's the map of Pachana, and it's a single map." But if you take these nine maps, you can actually make a three by three grid. It's about seven feet wide by about six feet tall of the entire world of Falstava, and you can put it on a wall. And once again, I mean, I'm inspired by a lot of what I grew up doing with Dungeons and Dragons. I had the eastern and western maps from Dungeons and dragons that were created with there was a, it was a beautiful map huge there was two there were each about six feet tall by about three feet wide and there's an eastern portion and a western portion and in, in university i had these two maps up on the, the dorm room wall in the common area because we ran our D, D groups that i that i ran there and there was these giant wall maps that set up the entire year it doesn't matter what was going on uh we only played once a week but these maps were always on the wall and with this a uh, map pack of Fulstavi of the three by three, so there's nine maps. Yeah, you can have the entire uh, wall uh, filled with the entire globe of Fulstavia if that's what you decide to do. Or you can just pull out an individual map and shove it on the table during the game if you have a more localized type game. We wanted to give the the flexibility of what you wanted in your own game. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to um, shadow threats. Now, is I. As I as I recall, there's been there's been at least one um, standalone adve standalone adventure module, but Shadow Threats, from what as I understand it, is more of a collection. No, so what is it? Uh, so the adventure that you might be thinking about. So when we did the the game screen, we do include a 32 page adventure in the game screen, which is an introductory adventure. So what Shadow Threats are? It's a multi 
part adventure, but it's still a single adventure. It's just, you know, here's what happens during the first part, and maybe the first part will take one session. And then there's a second part, so after the players finish what's happening in session one, uh, you know, a week later they come back and they can work on the next session. So it is a single adventure, but we divide it into multiple parts. And so while we've done it before with the game screen, this is the first standalone adventure that we've done, and we set it within the world of Fulstavia, uh, because that is, you know, the Anime 5e setting, but you don't need the Hostavia book. That's it's just it's set there. You you could decide to set it anywhere, uh, and it's a fairly straightforward adventure. I mean, in 32 pages, you're not going to get a, you know this massive adventure path with all these different branching elements. But if anyone has read any of the types of adventures we do for any of our game lines, uh, they're they're not linear dungeon crawls. That's kind of not the adventures that we do. So this is not fully. Uh, introductory. It's not the you know characters at first level. These are fifth or sixth level characters. Is kind of where the sweet spot is. But again, very customizable, and uh, this is just designed to give people something that they don't have to make up themselves. I mean, Anime Five E is is wonderful in its breadth of what it can do. But we know how daunting it can be to make everything up from scratch sometime. And we, it happens with Bessem, uh, you know, as well as a multi-genre universal game system. So maybe people just want to pick up a quick adventure and run it, and boom, here's something that'll last probably three to four sessions, depending on on how much your your players argue <laughs> with what's going on. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, just a quick way to, to get in and jump in and do some Anime 5e role-playing. Yeah. Now, taking that into account, what could you, what would you describe the the tone and the style of Shadow Threats to be as far as adventures go? Since being so, being so multi genre, even within fantasy, there's a lot of potential directions that can be taken when do, when doing a adventure. There is, and, and this one moves through different beats, so it does have elements of heroism, uh, but it also has some. Um, a little bit of detective work uh, in other aspects. We got to kind of figure out what's going on. Maybe a little bit of subterfuge that you might think it's one thing, but there may be something else behind it. I mean, I wouldn't say this is groundbreaking in the sense we're doing something completely different. I mean, I've run many uh, adventures in my own world that, that I've made up and, and over the years that are kind of like this, where the characters, you want them to be heroic, you want them to save people, you want them to fight the, the you know, monsters and creatures, you want to figure out what's going on and, and who's really behind everything, and you want to uh, be the hero uh, in the end. So this very much fits into that. I would say probably high fantasy is where it's more leaning towards with a little bit of of, of dark elements to it mm -hmm. i mean obviously with a name like shadow threats you kind of have to deliver on that front yeah <laughs> very true but now with all with all of that with all of that said as i understand it you're shooting for a august delivery date according to the kickstarter um is that is that's do you see? Do you still see it as something that you pl that you plan on being able to get out in August, or do you think, or do you think it's going to, some parts are going to get out sooner as far as digitally goes? So August is the digital release date, and so uh, most of our Kickstarters that we do uh, up until now, within just a few weeks of the Kickstarter entering, we usually send out the digital rewards. But with this particular one, we uh, have some art assets and cartographic assets that we're still waiting on. So some things got delayed. Uh, you know, it is what it is. But you know, we had a window that we wanted to run the Kickstarter in, so we decided to still run the Kickstarter, even though the the products aren't going to be in people's inboxes until August is when we expect all the files will be done yes the writing may be done and most of the layouts done at this point but we need those pieces of art to come in still uh, and it'll just give us a little bit more time to, to edit re-edit and re uh, refine as well there's you know nothing wrong with taking the time to do it right but that will be in August and then after that point then things are going to go to press so we're looking at end of the year December is the date we're announcing for the print copies in the end of course a lot of things will depend on global uh, shipping and printing situations but we think things are more under control now certainly than they have been in the past few years so we think december is completely feasible based on uh, what we've been hearing from our printers and whatnot but we're yeah that's why it's an august digital delivery and then end of the year for the physical mm -hmm. and with the, now and with that in mind i will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular brand of madness that happens around here. 
Well, I appreciate, you know, every time I'm on and uh, get a chance to talk about what, what we're doing and, you know, we're super excited to bring out the first expansions for Anime 5e. So thanks for giving us a chance to uh, talk to your listeners. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!